Hello, and congratulations on registering with the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission. This DVD is designed to help you in your role as a management committee or board members of your charity. Apart from this short video, you'll find a few other things on here. There's a PowerPoint presentation that explains what it means to be a registered charity, what the ACNC does, and how you can get the most out of your dealings with us. There's also a copy of the ACNC legislation in plain language, a guide on how to report to us, fact sheets on your responsibilities, and the answers to some frequently asked questions. But first of all, here's a message from Susan Pascoe, the Commissioner. Hello. Welcome and congratulations on registering your charity with us. Being registered with the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission means that the Australian public can see you're a well-run, transparent and accountable charity. Donors can give to you confidently, knowing their money will be going to the cause they want to help. Charities exist to make the world a better place. They couldn't run without people like you on their management committees and boards. I thank you for taking on this role and hope it is both rewarding and enjoyable. Your commitment and energy will directly impact your charity and everyone it helps. You have the ultimate responsibility for running your charity, for its property, its finances and for any staff or volunteers. You help plan your charity's future, develop its work and deliver on its charitable purposes. You also ensure it's accountable to those it assists, to the ACNC and the public in general. Effective management committees and boards need a range of people with a good mix of skills. The best boards are also diverse, comprising some people with a deep understanding of the needs to be met and others with strong financial, business and management experience. Working with and learning from people of different backgrounds and skills is an enriching experience. Our aim is to provide education and guidance to help you to run your charity well. We have a website that contains helpful information and an advice team who are here to assist you any way they can. You can get advice by calling us, emailing us, writing to us or even by approaching us through social media. At times, we'll be on the road and we're always happy to talk to you in person. One of our main objectives is to cut the red tape that you and other charities are subject to, where you have to file the same thing to lots of different parts of government. We're working to a position that once we have your details, you'll no longer need to provide them separately to a whole host of Commonwealth agencies. You may still have to report to your state or territory regulators, but we're working with them to reduce that as much as possible. We at the ACNC wish you and your charity every success, and we want you to know that you are not alone. Now let's hear from Murray Baird, an Assistant Commissioner at the ACNC, to talk about the legislation, explain more about our regulatory approach, and offer some advice on good governance. Hello, I'm Murray Baird, Assistant Commissioner, General Counsel. I'd like to give you some context about where the ACNC legislation came from. The ACNC legislation is the product of over a decade of government inquiries. All of them recommended a focused, dedicated regulator of the not-for-profit sector. Since the 2011 federal budget, which is when the government committed to establishing the ACNC, there have been numerous drafts and consultations on this legislation. Three parliamentary inquiries took scores of public submissions prior to the ACNC Act being passed. The result is an act that makes us, the ACNC, responsible for protecting and enhancing public confidence in Australia's not-for-profit sector. So that's our side of the bargain. As members of the management committee or board, you've made a commitment to the integrity of the sector as well. Even if you're a volunteer, you have some legal duties. You're required simply to be careful and conscientious. The law describes your relationship with the organisation as fiduciary, meaning one that's based on trust, 
like a relationship between a doctor and patient. Of course, these responsibilities are not new. They go back centuries. Essentially, they're the responsibilities of trustees of charitable assets. Your four main legal duties are to act in the best interests of the organisation and for a proper purpose, to act with reasonable care and skill, and that includes the duty to prevent insolvent trading, not to improperly use information or position, and to disclose and manage conflicts of interest. Let's look at each of these in turn and, and discuss what they mean. The duty to act in the best interests of the organisation means that you leave other loyalties at the door and make decisions that you honestly believe are best for the organisation you are governing in that room. This overrides personal interests and applies even if you are sent as a representative of another organisation. Acting with reasonable care and skill. That means you must exercise a standard of care and skill that a reasonable person would exercise if they are in your shoes. Just be careful and conscientious to the extent that a bystander would expect. At its most basic, you need to turn up at meetings on time, having read and thought about the matters for consideration, unless there's a good reason for your absence. Make sure you understand the issues and the documents before you cast your vote. Do things independently of what others think. Don't just follow the crowd. Now, not improperly using information or position means that the special knowledge that comes to you as a director is to be used for the organisation, not for your personal or, your other, or any other interest. A, a typical example in a profit-making company is to use confidential information to buy or sell shares. But in a not-for-profit, it, it might mean where information about a government tender uh, could be passed on to a rival organisation. Disclosure and management of conflicts of interest. This means that you should manage personal interests that conflict with the interests of your organisation that you are bound to protect. For example, you should notify the board as soon as possible of any potential conflicts and generally not take part in that discussion or that decision making. A good idea is for the board to have a standing agenda item, giving directors the opportunity to disclose any conflicts and perhaps even a register of potential conflicts tabled at each meeting. When we talk about good governance, what we mean is, are there appropriate arrangements in place to steer and protect the organisation as it carries out its mission? And there's not a, a one-size-fits-all answer. A small community organisation will work differently to a large national welfare agency. At the ACNC, we know that, and we'll be proportionate in our expectations. The ACNC Act also places some responsibilities on directors. Under the Act, directors are called responsible entities. For unincorporated associations, responsible entities share all the responsibilities set out in the Act with the association. For incorporated bodies, directors are responsible for dishonest, grossly negligent or reckless actions. But having said all that, our regulatory approach is not that we'll be heavy-handed in the way that we look at the governance of charities. Rather, we'll be here to help those who are doing their best and only crack down in cases where there's deliberate and continued wrongdoing. And we're expecting those cases to be very rare. We've put together a plain language guide to the Acts to make sure it's accessible to everyone. You can find a copy of it on this disc. And you can find a complete guide to your responsibilities as a director on our website. Now we'd like to introduce David Locke, who came to the ACNC from the UK's Charity Regulator. Hello, and congratulations on becoming a registered charity in Australia. I'd like to talk about what it means to be a registered charity. In addition to giving the public confidence in you, being a registered charity gives you access to all the help that we offer. Charities improve the lives of us all, and at the ACNC we're proud of our role supporting charities through our education and advice services. Our advice services team is here to answer your questions and we're available between 8am and 8pm 
Australian Eastern Standard Time, and that's Monday to Friday. So you can contact us by phone at 13ACNC, or you can email us at advice at acnc.gov.au, or alternatively, if you prefer, write to us. We know that charity law can be complex, and that many management committee and board members like you are volunteers doing this in your spare time. Like many of our staff at the ACNC, I've been a board member of charities both large and very small. Our education team is dedicated to producing high quality materials to help you find your way through the law and practice and to help your charity to thrive. We're keeping a register of all charities in Australia so that the public can find information out about your charity. It's called the ACNC Register and we're responsible for keeping it up to date. Now in order to do that, we need you to let us know if your charity changes its name or your charity changes its address for service. And by that, we mean the address that you wish to receive correspondence at from the ACNC. Also, if there are changes on your management committee or board, or your charity changes its governing rules, then you should let us know. If your charity can't comply with its requirements under the ACNC Act, then also you should let us know and contact us if you're in any doubt about this. If you're a small charity with an annual income under $250,000 per year, then you've got 60 days in which to let us know. If you're a larger charity, then you should tell us within 28 days of the change. So, do I have to file anything else? Well, yes, every charity will have to fill out an annual information statement. This is a two-page annual return that you can fill out online or you can fill out in paper. And if you want to do it by paper, then just give us a call and we'll send you a copy. It's easy to fill out and shouldn't take too long, and we'll help you if you need assistance. The annual information statement has to be submitted within six months of your financial year end. And the first annual information statements are due in 2013, and then every year after that. So, when is the uh, year end? Well, for many charities, that will be the tax year. So, we don't need your annual information statement until after the 30th June 2013, and then you have six months in which to send it to us. So, if your financial year ends on the 30th of June 2013, you've got until the 31st of December 2013 to do this. Now, we know that for some charities, they have different financial years, and many charities, their financial year is the end of the calendar year. So if your charity's financial year ends on, say, December the 30th, 2013, then your annual information statement isn't due for six months. So that's effectively, it's due by the 30th of June, 2014. So what about accounts? Do you have to send them to us? Well, the answer is if you're a small charity, and again, that's one with an annual revenue or income of less than $250,000 a year, then no, you don't have to send us your accounts. So all you have to complete is the annual information statement. If you're a larger charity, so a medium charity, and that is a charity with an annual revenue of between $250,000 and $1 million a year, then you will have to send us a copy of your accounts. But the first year that you have to do this is for the 2014 financial year, and then every year after that. Your accounts do not need to have been fully audited, though. A review by an accountant will be sufficient. And if you check our website, you'll see there's more information on what this means and how you go about doing that. If you're a large charity with a revenue of more than $1 million a year, then you will need to get your accounts audited and send a copy of those to us. Our approach is to work with you to help you comply. 
and we'll send out reminders of what's needed and when it's needed. The reason we collect this information is not for our purposes, it's to put on the ACNC register. So this is information for the public, for your donors, for others who might be interested in your work. And we'll work with you to make this as smooth and as painless as possible. I wish you every success and I hope that your charity goes from strength to strength. David's mentioned the traditional channels you can use to get in touch, but there are a few other ways you can have a conversation with us. Share your thoughts on Twitter, Facebook or on LinkedIn and feel free to send us invites to your conferences and events. Whenever possible, we'll come to you. Also, keep an eye on our YouTube channel for news from us and the sector. So from all of us here at the ACNC, welcome. We look forward to working with you.